Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Elena Gross, a neuroscientist, PhD in clinical research founder of Keto Swiss. What is energy metabolism and how do we extract energy from our environment? Living organisms such as humans are really unique in the way that they can extract food from their environment and convert it into an energy form that they can actually use. In humans, this energy form is called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which we will come back to later. Our bodies need this ATP to do everything, literally from thinking, moving, to growing, developing, even when we're at rest, our bodies need energies for all the hidden functions, such as repair, breathing, adjusting hormone levels, growing and repairing ourselves. So how do we and ourselves respectively get from energy in the environment to ATP so that we can live and thrive? In simple terms, metabolism is the process in which our body converts what you eat and drink into energy. Nutrients found in food and beverage, are combined with oxygen to create this ATP that your body requires to function and this involves thousands of coordinated multi-step metabolic reactions in our cells that all happen in parallel all regulated in the body to keep our cells and our organs healthy and also the brain healthy and working before metabolism can take place in your cells we need to digest the food the macronutrients into nutrients or smaller components that the body can actually use. Now, for example, if you eat a balanced meal that contains carbohydrates, protein, and fat, that looks a bit like the following. In the mechanical digestion in our mouth, we already start breaking down uh, these bigger food compounds into smaller compounds, and then in your gut, the stomach, chemical digestion takes place, with, which involves enzymes, and these enzymes break down those smaller food compartments into smaller items. Now these smaller compounds known as macronutrients are absorbed into the blood. This is where they need to go and this is where they will be carried around the body to wherever they're needed. And for example, glucose will be used as a primary energy source, so will be fats sometimes, but the body in emergency situations can also use those amino acids to make energy. But typically amino acids are not there to be turned into energy. This is very important. It's not an energy source, it's a building source. Metabolism basically is a balancing act between two different processes that you may have already heard before. As the first one is building tissue and filling up energy stores. That's called anabolism. And it is an, happening in an energy surplus, so basically after you've just eaten. And the opposite is the breaking down of tissues and energy stores. And that's called catabolism. And that happens, for example, in an energy deficit when you're sleeping and can't eat, for example. Now, anabolism is all about building, uh, storing, growth of new cells, uh, maintenance of body tissue, and so on. Um, storage for energy for later on in, in a good situation, in an energy surplus situation, and also turning small molecules into bigger molecules, more complex molecules, such as carbohydrates, proteins, or fats. Catabolism is the opposite. It's the breaking down um, that is a process that produces energy, so we're making energy from our stores. Um, it's breaking down large molecules, again, into in the fat stores or carbohydrates or glycogen, into smaller molecules so that we can release energy. And this heats up the body, this enables muscles to contract and so on in a period where we, not have, where we haven't been eating. So these processes are at the core of uh, metabolism. Now, metabolism we already discussed uh, is wouldn't really work without those tiny little powerhouses that we call mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses that supply all cells with ATP. Without ATP, nothing really works. It's needed for any reaction from detoxification to digestion to immune function um, and, and even for breathing and sleeping and eating and everything, moving, thinking, anything you do needs ATP. And the conversion from the energy, from the food that we eat is into ATP is actually happening inside of the mitochondria. Metabolism in the gut means we're breaking things up in such small pieces that they can travel around the body and get to the mitochondria, but it's really only there that most of our energy is produced. In order to, for us to do those things that we need to function and really um, convert those 
fats into carbohydrates and then ATP. Um, we need vitamins, minerals as well, micronutrients, as well as those macronutrients that we discussed. So mitochondrial functioning needs the micronutrients as much as the macronutrients. And this is something that is frequently overlooked, and especially for the migraine patient or any patient really, it's important that you have those micronutrients there to make enough energy to start the healing process and supply your cells, your immune system, your brain with sufficient energy. Now, astonishingly, for you to function on a daily basis, the amount of ATP the, the body needs to produce equals your body weight. So in a 70 kilogram person, that means that the body is turning over 70 kilograms of ATP per day so that you can live a normal life. I find that really, really, really astonishing. Well, whenever ATP levels are lower than that, lower than what is required to sustain all your body's functions, that means something goes wrong. You're seriously in trouble. And this can then be either triggering a migraine, but it can also be uh, a cause or a contributing factor of almost any chronic disease that we know. Mitochondrial functioning is at the core of health, brain health, and also health in general. And it's so important that we as a human are keeping our mitochondria healthy and happy. Levels of ATP can be reduced by lack of macronutrients, oxygen, but also any of the micronutrients. So this could be some of the reasons why your ATP levels aren't high enough. But mitochondria is also impaired by, for example, increased oxidative stress, these free radicals that is at the core of reducing mitochondrial functioning. Now, unfortunately, mitochondrial DNA has very few repair mechanisms. So here's our mitochondria floating around in our cell cytoplasm, being frequently bombarded by all the oxidative stress because it doesn't have protection. And then it doesn't even have any repair mechanisms to repair mutations that may be occurring. It's very likely that over years living in such a toxic environment as we are today, some of those mutations may accumulate and may lead to acquired problems with mitochondrial functioning not hereditary, meaning not being passed on from your parents, but actually being caused by our toxic environment. Because so many substances are actually attacking mitochondrial functioning, toxins, herbicides, pesticides, there's so many toxins out there that will impair mitochondrial functioning. And mitochondrial dysfunction is part of almost any disease. I can only stress that again. Many studies have also revealed, no surprise, that mitochondrial functioning is impaired in migraine as well. This brings us now to antioxidant capacity and oxidative stress. You've heard this all along through the different videos, but what is actually oxidative stress? Oxidative stress refers to the buildup of a particular family of reactive molecules in the body, and these are called reactive oxygen species. In short, ROS. The formation of ROS can be induced by a variety of external agents, so not just internal energy production, but also external agents such as heavy metals, pollutants, toxins, even drugs, smoke, tobacco, or radiation, all of these are pro-oxidative stress. Oxidative stress um, is not only bad. Nothing in the human body typically is purely good or purely bad if its levels exceed your own body's capacity to neutralize or catch those free radicals. So some oxidative stress is necessary for cell signaling, for the immune response, and to deal with the positive effects of exercise even. When you do sport, oxidative stress goes up and then can help new muscle growth and synthesis. So it's really a bit like um, what doesn't kill you, make you stronger. Think of oxidative stress a bit like, for example, fire, right? Some fire is essential for cooking or for heat, but if the fire exceeds your capacity to handle it properly, it can burn down your whole house, right? So only if your fire extinguishing capacities are good enough, to get rid of uh, the fire, oxidative stress is a good thing. Whenever ROS exceeds your body's own um, capacity to neutralize it, it can be very harmful. And I think this is the case in many migraine patients, especially prior and during a migraine attack. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Elena Gross, a neuroscientist, PhD in clinical research, founder of Keto Swiss.